Hey guys, Aaron Dorr here with the American Firearms Association. We love doing these self-defense breakdown videos where we show our members what went right and what went wrong in various self-defense scenarios. The goal of these is very simple, to help prepare all of us mentally and physically. If it ever happens to us, we know how to best defend ourselves and our loved ones. If you're not watching these videos, subscribe to our channel and make sure you see these every time they come out. And one of the most common questions I receive from these videos online, in person, in state capitals, at gun shows, is Aaron, okay, I understand how to defend myself physically, but what do I do to defend myself legally in the wake of a self-defense situation? That's a very smart question to ask because even before Mark McCloskey and Kyle Rittenhouse, America's had a real problem with liberal prosecutors in blue and in red states who tried to bury gun owners who are forced to use proper force to defend themselves from a violent criminal. In many cases, what you say or don't say in the moments after a use of force situation will decide whether or not you were cleared of all charges or spend decades in prison. So we're going to give you our top five list. And I want to, before I do that, I want to be very clear. We're not lawyers. I'm giving you AFA's position on the top five list based on our decades of experience working in state capitals and in Congress on proper use of force laws, senior ground laws. And during that time, we've met some very terrible situations where good guys were put in prison because the laws sucked. Follow this top five list to minimize that threat to you. So number one, after a use of force situation, make sure someone calls the police. The first person who calls the police in their system is labeled as the victim. So if the bad guy calls first and he says, someone shot me, well, guess what? He's the victim. You're the suspect. And when the cops arrive, they're going to treat you and him accordingly. On the contrary, if you call first, you're the good guy who was almost robbed, almost uh, you know, killed almost whatever. And the guy you were forced to shoot, he is the suspect. So you must call the police first. Now I want to be clear on this. That could easily mean, in fact, that should mean that your spouse calls the police, your buddy calls the police, because what you say to the police already in that first phone call can be used against you in court. So if I'm there with one of my friends, or my spouse, I'm going to have that person call the police. If there's nobody else there, I'm going to have to call them myself. It's a very simple phone call. Your name, your description, your location, and be clear, somebody attacked me. I had to shoot somebody in self-defense. Please send the police and send an ambulance. Those are your five points. Get it said. Get off the phone. Be clear on this also. Just because you shot that guy does not always mean that situation is over. He might not be dead. He may have accomplices. So this should not be a long phone call where you're distracted on the phone and you're not watching out for your physical safety. So step one, call the police. Step number two, preserve any witnesses and evidence as best you can if you're not in immediate danger. If somebody has seen you attacked by somebody else and he watched you use uh, proper defensive force, that witness, if you lose him, that's very damaging to your legal safety down the road. So you want to make sure you can collect as much evidence as you can. If it ever happens to me, I'd like to think when the cops arrive, I'm going to be standing on top of the bad guy's knife, the bad guy's gun, the bad guy's weapon with my foot, because I want to make sure the cops know this was the weapon the bad guy had. That's why I was in fear for my life. That's why I used defensive force. So you want to collect witnesses and evidence, because if it's gone, the police may not be able to ever get it back. That is step number two. Step number three is kind of an add-on to this list. This has come around in the last 10 or so years with better smartphones and better cameras. And number three for me is document the scene with as many photographs as you can possibly get. It's easy. We all have smartphones. They all have great cameras. And what you see that in the moments after that situation may be different than when the cops arrive. It may be different than when the investigators arrive. You want to document witnesses. You want to document you know, traffic, lighting. You want to document everything. His weapon, your weapon, as many photographs as you can possibly get, I would take those photographs. Now, again, this is only if the scene is secure. If you're still in an active, dangerous situation, keep your freaking phone in your pocket, your gun in your hand, and defend yourself. 
But once things have calmed down, get photographs if you can. And if it was me, I would be texting them to my lawyer, get them off of my phone to make sure that there's at least two copies of these photographs. That's step number three, take photographs. Step number four is interacting with the police when they arrive. This gets very dangerous for you legally. So you have to be careful on this. The, the, the smartest answer here is to say nothing. And most people would say, say nothing. I would tell you something different. I would say you have to say enough to make it clear to the authorities that you are the victim. And I'm borrowing this from my friend Masada Ayub, who is the expert in all of this. If you haven't taken one of his classes, you must do so. The same thing will come from Masada Ayub. He'll tell you to say, tell the police, that that guy tried to attack me. He tried to murder me. He tried to rob me. If you're a woman, he tried to rape me. Tell them what happened in a one-line sentence. He tried to rob me, try to kidnap my children. He tried to rape me, whatever the allegation was, whatever happened, and I defended myself. I will happily testify against him in a court of law. And that one paragraph tells the authorities very concisely that's what he did. That's why this guy used his firearm, and he's not, he's not flaky. He will testify in court. Make that part very clear to them. And step number five is say nothing else. Say nothing else and call your lawyer. Now, for a lot of you, you might say to yourself, well, of course, I'm never going to say a word to the police. But I'll tell you right now, if you talk to a veteran, you talk to police or armed uh, you know, folks who have used firearms in a self-defense situation, especially outside of the color of law, if, if you're a citizen, a homeowner, for example, not a cop, the urge to justify your actions that follows a use of force situation is a very, very strong urge. And many people get what's, uh, what's referred to as diarrhea of the mouth, and they are determined to tell the authorities, the arriving officers, the investigators, and the prosecutors, everything that happened, every thought they had, every little detail because the, the concern in your mind is if I don't tell them everything, they're going to think I'm guilty. And in doing that, you endanger yourself legally in ways you can't even comprehend. There's a reason why police officers are ordinarily given 24 hours after a use of force situation before being required to make a statement. It's because the police departments know that after that situation happens, your body has so much adrenaline in it, you can't even think straight. So the 24 hours that cops are often given gives them time for their bodies to come down and for them to talk to a lawyer and have counsel present to make an accurate and careful statement. We as citizens should have at least that much time because we're not trained in this. It's not part of our day job, and we don't have a policy that protects us in the wake of a use of force situation. So you need to tell the, tell the police the initial statement, as I said, step number four, and after that say, guys, I'll answer all your questions. First, I need to talk to a lawyer. That is step number five. You'll have various people asking you the questions over and over and over. The initial officers, the homicide guys or the, uh, who arrive on the scene, and then the prosecutors who will arrive on scene or at the police department. They're all going to ask you a variations of the same thing. And your answer must be the same every time. Guys, I will answer all of your questions. I need some time to catch my breath and call a lawyer. That's it. If you go beyond that, you run the risk of saying things in the wrong way that could really harm you down the road in court. Guys, that is our top five list. As always, this is a very controversial space. So if you agree with us in the comment section, let us know. If you disagree, let us know in the comment section. If you have your own top five list, let us know that as well in the comment section. Guys, subscribe for more content. We'll keep you guys informed. Take care.